All right, tonight we'll be talking about the filling of the Spirit. Filling of the Spirit. This is one of the most important doctrines to a Bible-believing Christian, is to make sure that he is filled with the Spirit of God. This doctrine changed my life forever, and I hope that it will change yours. It's from a branch of pneumatology. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, the outline can be found at our website, bbcenglish.org. This particular outline gives you all the studies that we'll be covering throughout this discipleship or beginner's discipleship. So one of the branches you'll notice is pneumatology in your outline. You'll notice that. And then one of the doctrines within pneumatology is the filling of the Spirit. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, please. The first point we'll be covering is that it is a command. Understand that the filling of the Spirit is commanded. It's not an option. It is commanded. So think about it. If every Christian was filled with the Holy Spirit, do you know how much the world will be changed? That means then there are a good amount of Christians who don't follow this, and I'm going to include our church as well, that means. So understand this is not just an option. A lot of people take this as an option. No, it is a command by God. The Bible says four simple words, quench not the Spirit. So you'll notice right here it is very possible to quench the Holy Spirit. Quenching is possible. Hence, God does not want you to quench the Spirit because he said it's commanded not to. God commands you not to do it. Commands you to not quench. There's something that's preventing the Holy Spirit from growing within you. And that's why the church cannot grow. That's why God does not bless you with fruits. Ephesians chapter 5, please. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. He commands you to be filled so much with the Spirit that the filling of the Spirit has to be to the point like filling yourself with alcohol. Now, obviously, God condemns being drunk in alcohol. But his point right here is just like how you see an alcoholic craving for another drink to fill himself with, you have to do the same thing with the filling of the Spirit. Yeah. Filling to be drunk. So when you're drunk, you're out of control because you're being controlled by the drink. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're at that feeling where it's drunk, that means you are not controlled by yourself, but you're controlled by some other power controlling you. And that's how you can preach more effectively, talk to people more effectively. Just by being there, your presence, the person's going to say, there's something, whew, there's something powerful about that person. And it's gonna be like a magnet that'll attract you. You just bring Brother Chuck to a room and then all of a sudden it's just like attracting people. It's that kind of a presence. It's that kind of a power, see. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 should be memorized. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice that this is a command. You see, that's a command. Another thing is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which we won't turn to for time's sake, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, the passage shows right here that your body does not belong to you. Does the body belong to you? Absolutely not. God says that the body belongs to the Holy Spirit instead. You'll notice that 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. So in that passage, what it's going to show right there is that because the Holy Spirit owns your body, that's why it's a command where you have to consecrate every aspect of your body, how it functions, what it's feeling, seeing, breathing even. All of it should belong to the Holy Spirit. Now imagine if every ounce of your body and being was controlled by God. Do you know how powerful you will become then? Do you see why this doctrine is extremely important? It is truly life-changing. 
Let's talk about the explanation for the filling of the Spirit. The explanation for the filling of the Spirit. So let me explain how this process works. A lot of people may not understand it as fully. First of all, you must understand that it is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is not the same thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You ever seen those charismatic? Have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost? Have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost? You know, that thing is nonsense. No, we do not believe that it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We believe that it's a filling. Look at this passage so that I can explain further. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 13 and verse 17. And then if you have that, then you can turn to your, when you have time, to Galatians chapter 4 and Ephesians 1. So I'll write it out here, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and then your second one to go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. What you're going to find out is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the same thing because baptism of the Holy Spirit refers to salvation here. So if you've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already baptized by the Holy Spirit. Hence, you don't need it again. A lot of people think that they lost their salvation because they did not re retain the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You must understand what baptized means is immersion, to be immersed under, immersed under. That's what baptism is. But what filling means is something you put within, something you let it grow and fill within, not just getting a dunk. So it's not just going underneath the water, immersion covered under the water. You also have to have something to fill up inside you. It's got to fill within as well. It's got to grow. Filling means a growing process. See that? We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. See that? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? So notice in verse 17 that the whole body of Christ is not limited to one member, the eye or the hearing. So you've got to understand that the body of Christ is everybody. It's not selected members. Okay, then that means then, if you're part of the body of Christ, there is no elite members in here, there is no special member here, one being, more, one being more better than you in the baptism of the Spirit. No, this baptism of the Spirit is for every member in the body, because at verse 13, we're all baptized into the body. And verse 17, there is no special member who has some eclectic speaking of tongues, gobbledygook, <laughs> baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's got something special that you don't got. No, this applies to everybody, baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians chapter 1 now, and then verse 13 through 14, you got to understand that the Bible shows that the Holy Ghost is inside you when you get saved. The Holy Ghost is inside you when you get saved. Hence, the Holy Ghost is inside you. Why do you have to be filled? Because it has to grow. So, we all have the Holy Spirit inside us. That will never leave us. People think they lost it because they didn't speak in tongues. They didn't retain the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No, when you're saved, the Holy Ghost is inside you permanently. It will never leave you. Permanently, never leave you. So when it's sealed within you permanently, then you got to also understand that this thing can grow. The Holy Spirit can grow within you. That's why the filling is necessary. So let's prove this. Verse 13, in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that he believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, which is the earnest of our inheritance until when? When will this ceiling leave? 
the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. See, until you go to glory, the Holy Spirit cannot leave you. That ceiling lasts. What, and how did that happen? In verse 13, when you believed. You believed. That's why Galatians chapter 4 shows that the Holy Spirit needs to grow. It needs to grow. Notice that Paul specifically said the words that Christ must be formed in you, not just be in you. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be what? Formed in you. See, how much is Jesus Christ growing inside you? Hardly because you surrendered more and more of yourself to the world. The world is growing bigger inside you. The flesh is growing bigger inside you, not Jesus Christ. You are a liar when you say that Jesus Christ is the king of your life and he is number one in all you adore. You liar. You are a liar. And that's why you should check your heart. Are you preaching? Yeah, I'm preaching. Because in order to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you must realize that you are lying because you have not let, you have not let Jesus Christ be the focus of your life. Trials became bigger in your life instead. Persecution became bigger in your life. Temptation and sin is bigger in your life. Your, uh, your best friend became bigger in your life. Your pastor became bigger in your life. Your close friends became bigger in your life. Your father, your mother, your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your relatives, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa, etc. They are the ones that you're prioritizing more than Jesus Christ. They're the ones that you look at all the time rather than Jesus Christ. That's why you're not, you don't have any power in your life from God because the Holy Spirit's not filling up in you. Why? Because he's not forming. John chapter 7, verse 38 through 39. Uh, I, I don't, we, let's just turn over there because it is an important verse. It is an important verse. I quote this quite often concerning the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got to understand that the Holy Spirit, when he fills within you, it's not just filling, because when he fills within you, he's got to fill so much to a point where it flows out of you. The filling of the Holy Spirit must be so much that it's got to pour out of you. Filling excessively. Filling excessively that it pours out and affects It affects the person around you. It touches and reaches another person. You notice that with some preachers who are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can tell God is in them, but you know that it's coming out of them where it's reaching your heart and it's dragging you on the altar sometimes. See that power? All right, John chapter 7, verse 38 to 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, something is flowing outside within him. He's filled so much that it's flowing outside. That's the Holy Spirit at verse 39. See that? Now look at Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. That matches with John 7. If you're, a thirst, if you're thirsty, then he's going to give you so much to drink. But look at this, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. For example, if we didn't plant a Bible-believing church in this kind of dry ground area, that's why if uh, you don't feel as spiritually uh, survived, spiritually uh, drinking. How many people who came to our blowout felt so refreshed here? in this kind of wicked, dry, dry, dry ground because there were, there were some people here who brought forth so much water that it poured upon the dry ground that they would come to this dry place just to get a drink. See that? You see why this teaching is so important? All right, now let's talk about the conditions for the filling of the Spirit. Ah, you want to write this one down, right? You want to write this one down. The conditions for the filling of the Spirit. Okay, Pastor, I get it. Very important. Tell me what to do. I want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. More simple than you think. More simple than you think, but it's so amazing how many people don't do it. You ready for this? 
What's number one? Oh, I want to do this, Pastor. All right, you want to do it? We do it most of the time as Sundays. You see it online. You see it in our main channel. Get saved. You need to become a son of God. You need to become a son of God. Get saved in Jesus Christ. You'll, this is back at Galatians 4, 6, which we read earlier. The Bible says right here that Paul says that I travail to give birth again. See that? They're being born of God. But Christ needs to be formed in them. See, there's your filling. So in order to receive that forming of Christ or the filling, they had to be what? See, they had to be born first. My little children, Paul called them. See, they need to be a son of God first. That's the filling. Okay, so you better check your salvation, amen? Are you saved? If you're saved, then praise the Lord, you got that. Then here's the next one, John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39. The next thing you must have is you must have a strong desire. A strong desire. Well, I want it. You really want it? I don't know if you really want it that bad. If you really want it that bad, there's a lot of things that you would give up, a lot of things that you would sacrifice, a lot of things that you would do for the Lord. So notice that verse 37, 39, it shows the Holy Spirit inside you that it pours out of you and affects others around you, but it follows the condition, if any man thirst. Do you crave for the Holy Spirit when you drag yourself into church that Sunday and you don't feel like coming to church? Let's use some more specifics. When you are inside your own home and then the flesh crawls up within you and then you just don't want to read the Bible and bow on your knees and pray, can you say you have a thirst for God? See, that's why you don't have the filling of the Spirit. Check yourself. Already have that. No, no, no. Be more specific. Be more specific now. Ephesians, let's look at Luke chapter 11 now. Turn to Luke chapter 11 and verse 5 through 9 and 13. 5 through 9 and 13. So we read this one before from here, but this one we haven't, so we're going to turn over here. All right, the third condition is you need to pray for the filling of the Spirit. Pray for the filling. Did you notice your pastor doing that before he preaches? Do you notice... And there are times that I won't do it sometimes before I preach. The reason why is because I already did it before. But whenever I go to church, I would always pray for this one. This is like, look, man, this is something that's not just one time a day. This is like three to five to ten times before anything you do in your life, before you go to work, before you talk to somebody, before you come to church. This is so essential. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 9. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 9. Jack Hiles, flawed he may be, and a lot of problems with him, there was one thing that he had right, was this kind of teaching where he would say, pray for power, pray for power. He would write little sticky notes and put them in front of his fridge, in front of his mirror, in front of his car when he drives. So you got to think about that. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 9. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. Uh, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because... He is his friend, yet because of his what? Importunity. Yeah. See that? He's not giving up. Mm -hmm. He will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and he shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So notice from this whole passage what's going on. Jesus is giving a story that this man keeps knocking on the door, asking, asking, asking the friend at midnight to give him food. Obviously, the person does not want to do that. But because the person keeps begging and because he is his friend, the man will eventually get up and give him bread to eat. It's like some annoying people in my church who keep knocking to me and say, hey, pastor, let's do this. Pastor, let's do this. I go, yeah, okay, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, praise the Lord. I don't have time. Oh, come on, pastor. pastor. And because you are my members that I love you, and because it is midnight and I'm just so annoyed, I'm like, no, I'm too busy. 
Because of that importunity, I will give in and cave in. Amen. And then I will just, no, don't say amen. Be quiet. Don't say amen. <laughs> don't say amen. So because of that, I will cave in. I will cave in and then follow along. All right, let's go out and eat. All right, let's fellowship. Okay, let's go tracking. Okay, let's do street preaching. All right, let's do this. Hey, pastor, let's do this. All right, let me think and pray about it. Hey, pastor, let's do this. Did you remember? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll think and pray about it. And then, okay, let's do it. You see why God's power can fill within this church? See, it's, that's what you got to do with God. Give me your power, Lord. All right, here it is. No, I want more, Lord. No, I want more, Lord. There is this one preacher who was totally in the wrong, but at least he had this idea. He realized that when he was praying for his ministry, that uh, contentment was the wrong thing. He needed to do more. He needed to pray for more, get more people in. No, I'm too big. I don't want more. And no, you got to think bigger. You got to want more. See? Uh, you got to keep begging to God until every single soul around the world is saved and becomes a Bible-believing Christian and worships God like they're supposed to. Then your job is done. That's what I say. So if the Lord incredibly blessed our church, that's because of the mentality I had. And I wish every Bible-believing preacher was like that. Now, there are some Bible-believing preachers out there that definitely have it better than I do, so I'm not saying I'm the greatest. But I want to point out a sobering thought. If there is any blessing in my life God blessed me with that God didn't bless you, and yeah, I'm including Bible-believing pastors out there, this is something sobering you got to think about. you got to pray and you got to beg. Remember, the Holy Spirit can be filled in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, like drunkenness. Filling, filling. A lot of people think that, let's look at verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? A lot of people say, well, I already have the Holy Spirit in me, right? No, this verse is ask what? More. Yeah. See, you need more of the Holy Spirit within you. I'm so glad when I hear some of my disciples, when they preach, they will use this passage. Because that shows how you're taking this seriously about the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is truly life-changing. It was one of my favorite verses. I preached four different sermons on the filling of the Spirit, but can I tell you something? That's still not enough. One of my favorite sermons is when I talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit. I would recommend people to watch online Spirit Power. Spirit Power. I don't know. I preached that so many times in this church, and some of you heard that several times, but... I notice that a lot of you, it still feels like it's not old. Amen. You know why? We need that Holy Spirit Amen. filling all over again. Amen. But those of you who have not heard it, I'd recommend you to watch that. It changed my life forever, that sermon. It changed my life. Hiles had a sermon called Fresh Oil on that one. When I listened to that, it changed my life. And then I created the sermon, hence after that, called Spirit Power. Okay, so notice right here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 17 and verse 25. We won't turn there for time's sake, but the fourth condition is you got to yield to the Holy Spirit. you got to yield to the Holy Spirit. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, that means you're not yielding to the flesh. Let me repeat that. So the reason why the Holy Spirit is not filling inside you is because you're not yielding to Him. You're yielding to you. The flesh is you. The greatest enemy is not Satan. The greatest enemy is you. You are the greatest enemy. And you got to realize that you are your worst enemy. So you got to hate that person the most, not love that person the most. And love that person more than Jesus the most. How can you love the worst enemy more than your best friend who died for you? That will preach. All right. But I'm just wasting time preaching here. So I got to get going. But... Man, this is, you can see how much of a sermon this is, right? Yeah. You see how important this subject is. So the Holy Spirit is sometimes yanking on your heart like, you know you should have given the tract out over there to that person. Uh -huh. You know that you should have prayed at that moment rather than thinking that you can handle it. You know you should have went on the altar that time when there was something in your life you should have surrendered. You know that you shouldn't have, see that? See that? Now, if you yielded so much to that, do you realize, do you now understand why it can click in your head why you've become powerful in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why you're filled with the Spirit? You completely, every inch of your being, action, word, thought, deed, 
was purely from God. Now, ponder that for a while. Ponder that for a while. Do you realize how much power you would have if you would just simply yield to the Holy Spirit? Now, aren't these four conditions something that should be obvious? But you notice when I started to pinpoint specifics and examples in your life, you realized how much you lack on this? It's very important, the conditions of the filling of the Spirit. Okay, so these are the conditions for the filling of the Spirit that you should be following. All right, let me erase this one now. All right, let's look at several other points concerning about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now that you know the conditions, now we should learn the next part concerning how we get more of the Holy Spirit within us and where self is truly crucified. The first thing you got to understand, which is a total nonsense going around in churches, is they think speaking in tongues is the filling of the Holy Spirit. That is completely wrong. You got to realize this. Inaudible tongues is not the filling of the Holy Spirit. Inaudible tongues is not the filling of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. How do you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Those four conditions, you notice how powerful they are, right? But you notice the problem with charismatics where they will bypass those four important conditions and focus on doing blah, 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 blah like that. You notice how powerless they are as a result. You notice how much feeling of their flesh they are as a result. You notice how emotional they are as a result. And emotions are of the flesh, not of the Holy Spirit. The more you do this inaudible tongue nonsense is where you become more of a fleshy Christian rather than a spiritual, spirit-filled Christian. That's why this teaching, yes, I will kick it and I will continue to kick it even though I lose subscribers, which I know I am. Which I know I am. But you see, uh, this is good because the Lord cannot spirit fill our channel if I'm going to tolerate a lot of speaking in tongues nonsense and then cave in and compromise to that. All of you, I can't control all the subscribers online. You're more than welcome to watch us. I am glad that somehow you're promoting our Bible-believing work. That's a blessing. But the thing is, is that if you're in wrong doctrine and wrong teaching, I hope that you will change one day your belief. You can keep watching us online because I'm very happy that at least you can get the seeds planted within you and the Holy Spirit talk to you, even though you're in the wrong doctrine. Let's see right here. You'll notice right here when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Oop, I don't know where this wrong pen came from. Okay. So when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll notice that it was in an audible language. Peter spoke in an audible language. Let's look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. You'll notice that Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it reads right there, blah, 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 blah. Is that what your verse said right there, Acts chapter 4, verse 8? Nope. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. You'll notice when he was filled with the Holy Ghost, it did not go exclamation point Z, Z, C, A, B, C, X, Y, and Z. It was in an audible language when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's also look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 4 through 11. Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. You'll notice right here that Christians were filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, you'll notice they were audible languages. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and, and began to speak with other tongues. Oh, see, I told you so, I told you so. As the Spirit gave them what? Utterance. This is something that you can utter. Well, in the Bible it says something that cannot be uttered. Well, that's not speaking in tongues then in Acts chapter 2 verse 4. That thing that cannot be uttered is a totally different subject than in Romans chapter 8. So this verse will debunk their favorite passage, Romans 8, that is something that cannot be uttered. No, this verse shows speaking in tongues is uttered. 
Okay, but anyways, that's beside the point. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You see, Jews, and then verse nine through eleven. You see different languages there, right? You see that? Did it say Gabriel, Michael, and then the archangels' language over there, or did it gives people of different nations their languages? So you'll notice that speaking in tongues is something that was applied to the Jews during the age of the apostles and that it was in different languages. Speaking in tongues is different languages. Not some kind of heavenly language that you cannot be uttered. No, this verse is it can be uttered. I believe that I have this power today. All right, then talk to me in Chinese right now. Talk to me in Aramaic right now. Talk to me in Greek right now. You can't. You can't right now. Proves that it's not there today. All right, let's talk about the results of the filling of the Spirit. The results of the filling of the Spirit. Now, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, these are the kind of results you're going to see. And this is an important teaching where it can be kind of eye-opening where you see, are you filled with the Holy Spirit or not? And if you don't see these things out of your life, that shows that you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. But you're going to notice that during a blowout, for example, or during a summer camp, why is it that we said, man, the Holy Spirit was moving, moving? Maybe it had these results. Shall we see? The first thing is the power to witness to people. Power to witness to people. So you'll notice that we were outside going soul winning, right? During, let's say, a blowout meeting. Why is it? Why were we so rejuvenated, so pumped up to do that? Because someone was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. You can't live your life in fear then. You can't live your life avoiding. You can't keep saying, I don't know how to witness. That prevents the Holy Spirit to be filled within you. Think about that. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is one who is afraid that he can't soul win well and he's going to make mistakes and yet he just has an incredible burden and will just go out and witness to the person anyways. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Acts chapter 4. And then we will read verse 31. Here's another result of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Boldness to preach the word. Boldness to preach the word. You know how we know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? When somebody says, oh man, we're not doing street preaching today because it's raining. Oh, it's visitation, you know, not street preaching. Now obviously we should have a desire for visitation too. But I like it when a person has that kind of boldness to preach. It shows there's something when I touch a banner that I'm just going to preach out loud. See, why? Some, something is filling within you. There's something about it when liberal scholars, you know, mock Jesus Christ, and then you just want to have a boldness to preach. You just want to speak up for Jesus. And if it wasn't your pastor holding you back, hey, you're going to get kicked out of the class, so you got to use it wisdom and stuff like that. And you probably would have been kicked out. But see, that shows that you got a right spirit within you, is that that kind of boldness to preach, the boldness to preach. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. Oh, I didn't read Acts 1.8. Let's read that first. This is a great verse you should memorize, actually. Whenever I say memorize, I really mean that. There's a lot of Bible believers and even Christians who memorize these verses. If I ever mention that, you might want to uh, put a star on that and maybe memorize it in your own time. It says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Notice when they receive the Holy Spirit, this becomes so widespread, it will spread throughout the whole world. That's why in the first age of the apostles, during the, the first centuries of Christianity, it spread like wildfire. In fact, it was going all over where there were even Nestorians going as far as to Korea and probably to Japan, actually. First centuries. First centuries, it was very possible. Because why? They were spreading out. You will read stories. We're not sure how much of it is true, but you're going to read stories where there were apostles who actually may have reached 
towards certain Asiatic countries like India. There are several uh, cases of India. There was one possible case in Japan probably. And then other places, uh, stories concerning England, etc. Now, do you see what kind of day and age that was? What happened all of a sudden during the Dark Ages? Hmm. Lost it. And then the Great Awake, the, once the Protestant Reformation and Great Awakening Revival occurred, they revived it. What happened today? We're back to the Dark Ages again. You know what we learn from history? We never learn from history. <laughs> That's my favorite line. You know why? It's like kicking you in the mind saying, hey, stupid, you learned your lesson yet? It's like, uh, look, how many times do you have to hear a preaching or a teaching? And then you're like, oh, no, nah, you know, I think I might get away with it. Or you ignore it or you put it on a shelf and you don't think about it. And then when it happens to you, you're like, well, duh. I, sh uh, I mean, it's like the hundredth time till I finally get it. Yeah. Well, you might as well learn it now rather than doing the hundredth mistake. Yeah. Bless God, man. All right, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. The verse says right here, man, I, I want somebody to preach on this. I, uh, one of you disciples, I want you guys to preach on this, man. I want you to preach on this. That way we can just keep learning this lesson right here. Please, somebody preach this sermon about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. The verse says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What's the result? They spake the word of God with boldness. How do we know that our church is filled with the Spirit? Well, if we have, a lot, if we have people who are bold enough to still preach on the streets, people bold enough to say, hey, let's go witness in college campuses, people bold enough to say, yeah, let's go knock on this door and tell this person how to get saved, person bold enough to, let's say, distract the Jehovah Witnesses and witness to them. Jehovah Witnesses should be witnessed to, and then the rest of their partners can go out soul winning. You see, this is the kind of boldness that we need. All right, let's look at 1 John 4.4. 4. Okay, let's get this ball rolling. Okay, we got to get going. Confidence in victory. If you're filled so much with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have confidence in your victory, not fear. You're not going to doubt God. You're not going to live a life of defeat to your sin, to your trial, to your enemy. You're going to have confidence in victory. That's how you know a person is filled with the Holy Spirit. How did we know Luther was filled with the Holy Spirit? That man, he is known to pray three hours a day, actually. And he actually said, if you don't pray more than three hours a day, you're sinning. That's how far he said it. Now, you can tell then that man must have been filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know? It was that man who changed all of history, actually. Yeah. Luther. It wasn't Wycliffe and Huss. God used those men mightily, don't get me wrong, but there was something about Luther God used differently. That's why he was the one who came out on top with the victory. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God little children and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's another verse you should memorize, actually. Famous verse you'll hear a lot of pastors talk about. Romans 8, please. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Another evidence is assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation. If you're filled so much with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to doubt your salvation. Do you, one, do you know one thing I knew about people who doubt their salvation? You know who are the people who doubt their salvation, I started to realize? Those who are new in Christ, because they haven't grown much in the Holy Spirit yet. They're still new. Or those who lived a life of sin, because they feel like they lost their salvation. They're too wicked. And they're starting to look back in their life, and they're wondering, did I really repent? Did I really believe on Jesus Christ? There may be something within that sinner's prayer, I must have messed up in the world. See that? You're not growing in the spirit. But if you are growing, then you'll know that you're saved. You'll know that. That's why this is an assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and verse 16. Notice the word of God reads right here concerning about the assurance of salvation. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, look at that, they are the sons of God. See that assurance? Let's also look at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The more that 
you're led by the Holy Spirit, then you would have known within you the Holy Spirit telling you. Okay, let's also look at Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Now, this is one thing that I stress so much, especially in my area. I have to be more on guard on this than any other pastor, actually. And especially since we're online, that gives me a double burden right there, especially online. And that also gives a burden to this church as well. What is it? A good testimony to others. Good testimony. If you're filled so much with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a good testimony. Pastor, why is it that you told me that I can't do the spiritual thing for Jesus yet? You're telling me not to go street preaching in college campus yet. That I can't preach that way to my loved one and family member. That I can't, well, it's, uh, hey man, then you're not, you're not careful on your testimony. If you're careful and thinking about how you would look in the eyes of others, how your testimony would look in the eyes of others, that's why I'm careful with what I teach online as well, see? I don't go in arrogant mode and start my own little movement, build up my house in the middle of the woods somewhere, or turn pale face till I turn 60 with some kind of Trump sweater and then start just picking on every other preacher out there. So the thing is, is that, see, you got to watch your testimony. That shows that you lack the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because in your YouTube channel, all we see are people's names that you want to criticize, and they are KJV only dispensationalists too. What a testimony you got. See, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You lack power. You lack so much power. Well, I got a small number of subscribers. That means that uh, I'm serving Jesus Christ. Or it could mean, you, have, you ever thought about this? You lack power, Holy Spirit power in your life. That's why you remain small. Smallness is not all the time that you're in the right, folks. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. See that? People that can find a flaw in them when they report. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. I get so many people criticizing me online and putting up a report, but I'll tell you one thing. There's always a scripture verse that accompanies with what I say in the video, and there, were, there are people who know that too. See? At least I, that's my testimony. My testimony. Even when they try to find fault, they will never separate me. This man will use a scripture. Okay, let's also look at Acts chapter 13, verse 52. Acts chapter 16. Uh, 13, excuse me. Acts chapter 13 and verse 52. Do you have these results, folks? Do you have these results? Especially at San Jose Bible Baptist Church in this liberal community and that we're online. Uh, don't you think that we should have more of this? More of this than other churches? More of this than other churches? Should we open up altar call after discipleship ends? Let's, let's, do you have these results? Acts chapter 13 and verse 52. The Bible says right here, and the disciples were filled with what? Joy. But look at this, and with the what? Holy Ghost. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to have full of joy. Of course, there are days that you just feel tired and down, and you'll see your pastor like that too. But see, that's the flesh. When the flesh feels like that, then I'll have a different feeling within me that's full of joy. The great example is this, when you come to church. There's a part of you that is filled with joy. But there's a part of you that's like, oh, tired, you know, don't want to. You know what that is? That's just simply evidence of your flesh and your spirit. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see right here is that if you don't have that full of joy within you, then you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You come to church and their flesh is dragging you down. I'm tired. I don't want to do it. And we see that in your singing. We see that in your fellowship. We see that with your rotten testimony and attitude. We see that how you're ill, you're ill in response to the preaching of the word and then you walk out mad and pouting with your upper, upper lip sticking out folding up your hand like this and then just glaring at me oh yeah this preacher's been preaching for years okay you'd be surprised what people will do all right I had people just stare at me like this what will I do I'll just keep preaching that's it <laughs> I'll just keep preaching that's it so you got to realize this is that see that's then that's not being controlled by the Holy Spirit that's of the flesh then Okay, so let's also look at another passage, Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. 
I understand that feeling. You're, you're all tired. We're not bombarded by trials. I understand that because you've seen your pastor drag like that to church. But you also cannot deny that during those times when I felt down, those turn out to be the sermons that somehow became the most powerful that the Lord blessed and honored. Those of you who've been with me for years notice that, right? Why? Because I'm bragging about myself? No, because I'm trying to give you a specific example so you can fully understand. Because it shows right here that just because the flesh feels down, that doesn't mean it will deny the power of the Holy Spirit if you would just yield to Him. You can come up still with that full of joy and power. Sometimes you'll see your preachers in the middle of preaching say, man, I was just feeling down, but now I'm feeling good right now. You know, let me preach on this a little longer. You know, you'll notice sometimes I'll say that. Man, I just feel great, you know. <laughs> Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. It's full of wisdom. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with what? Wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. A Christian who is filled with the Holy Ghost is filled with wisdom. He's not going to be rash. He's not going to be foolish. The only reason why, if we have a lot of fruits in our church right now, is because there was a lot of wisdom imparted that we had to follow. Not foolishness, rashness, and then we get kicked out of YouTube, we get kicked out of this community, we get kicked out of our church. So you've got to be filled with wisdom. If you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll have strength against Satan. Strength against Satan. If you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you're also going to expose sin. Expose sin. Well, I don't like it when you cover that topic. Oh, sorry, man. Then I won't be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to keep exposing that sin. Sorry. I know you don't like it when I cover your worldly thing, your sin issue that you don't think it's a sin, a wrong doctrine that you don't think is wrong doctrine. Sorry, but I'm going to keep preaching in that. Otherwise, I lose the power of God. I care more about the power of God than pleasing you, sorry. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 19, you will be singing songs, singing songs. When I see a person who doesn't sing, and I know it's because, not because a person doesn't know the song, all right? I can tell the difference. A person doesn't sing, I know they don't have the Holy Spirit filling within them. They're filled with flesh. Another thing is thanksgiving to the Lord. So that will be in the same passage, Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. He will be singing songs. He will be thanking the Lord. Have you ever seen this one brother in our church when he's going through a trial? He'll say, thank you, God, for cancer. Thank you, God, for this trial and this hardship. And you know the Holy Spirit is in him when he says that. Submission to others. Submission. If you want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit then we got to see your life of submission, not rebellion, not I'm right and you're wrong, not that kind of disrespectful attitude or a false pretense of submission. Are you giving false submission too? That's very possible, especially in Bible-believing churches. I've seen this. Pastor, I love you. We pray for you. The very next day, backstab them. I've seen that happen. So that's false submission. Oh, I have submission. Oh, is it false, though? See, there's such a thing called false submission. So you've got to have true submission as well. Submission to others, not to you. The last thing, I don't have room to write over here. I must have skipped the number here. I have 13. Singing songs, thanksgiving, submission. Oh, okay, I see what I did wrong here. Okay, so that's 11, 12, and then 13, the last thing is bearing much fruit, bearing much fruit for the glory of God. That's found at John chapter 15, verse 5 and verse 8, compared with Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. Those of you watching us live online, just rewind the, just rewind the video and write those verses down that I said. All right, your homework assignment will be adoption. Adoption. Listen to the audio on adoption. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and make us realize how truly important we need to fill ourselves with you and empty ourselves of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.